Uh, I'm going to talk about the, uh, the Hermetica. which is, um, I noticed actually on the banner up here, you've got Thoth, the ibis-headed god of Egypt. It's him you've got to blame for all of this. It all goes back to ancient Egypt, which, uh, which is why we use the subhead on the book, The Lost Wisdom of the Pharaohs, which I know is, we've stated it boldly, it is The Lost Wisdom of the Pharaohs, but I noticed on the programme they put a question mark after it. As if to say, is it the lost wisdom of the pharaohs? I mean, you could say, well, what's a question mark between friends? Yes, yeah, just a question mark, isn't it? But as a writer, these things are quite important, you know. <laughs> My favourite example of that is the phrase, sort of. Yeah, it's a harmless little phrase, isn't it? We all say it, sort of. But if you add that to the sentence, I love you, <laughs> or if your doctor says to you, you're going to live, you can see it makes all the difference, doesn't it? <laughs> Little things, words, but very important. So, yes, is it the lost wisdom of the pharaohs? In the however many years it is since we wrote this, that's actually become the major issue for me. The fact that I do think this text gives us the best possible lens for looking back into the mind world of the ancient Egyptians. And unfortunately, the books of the Hermetica have really had a terrible press. For many years, they were outlawed in Europe. They just simply weren't available during the Christian period. The Arabs nurtured them, kept them alive. And then during the Renaissance, they were reintroduced back into Europe. But even then, there was a hatchet job done on them, saying... These aren't the books of Thoth. These don't tell you anything about ancient Egypt. These are Greek texts written in Greek for a Greek-speaking audience who were living in Alexandria in Egypt. And really, the Egyptian stuff in it, it's just decoration, just ornamentation to give it the impression that it's ancient wisdom. And that's why they've languished in such obscurity for so long. And in fact, until we did our book, they were only available as difficult, impenetrable texts, badly translated by a bunch of 19th century occult obscurantists. And nobody could really understand them. And I first came across them a long time ago, 1978. I was 18, and I got inducted into a Western magical order, which claimed to go back to the famous Golden Dawn, or infamous Golden Dawn. And we used to do these magical path workings, during which I had the most extraordinary experience in the Temple of Thoth. And I was an impressionable young man, and I thought, oh, that's an amazing experience. And that was my first experience. And then 20 years later, when I was doing my MA in classics. I was lucky enough to get a pass into the British Library, not the horrible one that's now in St Pancras, but the old one that was inside the British Museum. You might remember it. Well, you can go in there now. And I used to sneak off from doing my rather dull classics course. And you could order up any book you wanted. I would order up these alchemical books and hermetic books, and they'd be brought to you by somebody wearing white gloves placed in front of you, and you'd be given a pair of white gloves too, and you could, it was lovely, it was fantastic, I felt like a real scholar. <laughs> but at that point I thought, what really needs to happen is these need to be made accessible to people in a way that's easy to understand, but with some information about where they came from and what they are. And out of that came the Hermetica. And I was lucky at the time, I was living in Glastonbury in a lovely old cottage. I thought, Glastonbury, that's the place to do it. Mm -hmm. And I'd photocopied all these texts, and I was sitting there surrounded. And I started cutting them up into little bits and putting them together to try to get the books as I thought they probably were at their time. Try to restore them into a format in which we could bring some order 
back into the way they'd been. They were available in all sorts of translations, some of them from the Arabic, some of them. So eventually it all came together and then I thought, once it was done and the publishers said, yeah, that's okay, but we've sent it off to an Egyptologist and she's, yeah, she thinks it's okay, but she's not sure about this lost wisdom of the pharaohs. You know, she said, the pharaohs, some of them were remarkably stupid, you know. <laughs> but we let that pass, and anyway, it got published. So like I say, it's a long time ago now, but I was looking through it the other day in preparation for this. Oh, and thank you, Lucy, for inviting me along to this. Where is she? I'm so... This is the first time I've been out talking for years. A year and a half ago, I had a massive stroke. Oh, that's nice. I've got an R there. It's lovely. <laughs> And, um, and I, was, I was already quite reclusive, but that really sort of, um, that experience, I had six and a half hours on the operating table, I got a big metal plate in my head and all the rest of it. When I went to see the consultant, he said, how are you? I said, fine. He said, you got any questions? I said, yeah, what are these lumps here? And he went, oh, they're screws. <laughs> so anyway, so, so after that, I thought, and my co-author, Tim Freak, was saying, Pete, you should get out and talk on this subject. So when this offer came through from Gary, was it Gary? Where is he? Yeah. And he said, would you go out and do this gig at the Eternal Knowledge Festival? And Tim was going, yeah, get out there, do a tour. So here I am, yeah. And I'm really pleased to be here, and I'm so glad that so many of you have come to listen. So I was reading through the introduction. I thought, I've got to put an introduction to this so that people can really get a grasp on the history of it, because it's not just a set of interesting texts. These have had a profound influence on our culture. In fact, the very best things of our culture originate from the ancient teachings which were mediated through the Greeks. And I, so what I thought I'd do is actually read the introduction because I looked through it and I thought, yeah, it's, it's still good. It's, you know, there's a few things I would add now, but Actually, it'll give you a good idea of the history and the influence of the Hermetica. So, with your permission, I'll, um, I'll read from the introduction. Which starts with, A forgotten spiritual classic. Yeah, I still agree with that. The Hermetica is a collection of writings attributed to Thoth, a mystical ancient Egyptian sage whose wisdom is said to have transformed him into a god. Thoth, who was venerated in Egypt from at least 3000 BCE, is credited with the invention of sacred, sacred hieroglyphic writing, and his figure, portrayed as a scribe with the head of an ibis, can be seen in many temples and tombs. And here! Amazing. He is the dispatcher of divine messages and recorder of all human deeds. In the great hall of judgment, the afterlife court of the god Osiris, Thoth would establish whether the deceased had acquired spiritual knowledge and purity, and so deserved a place in the heavens. Thoth was said to have revealed to the Egyptians all knowledge on astronomy, architecture, geometry, medicine and religion, and was believed by the ancient Greeks to be the architect of the pyramids. The Greeks who were in awe of the knowledge and spirituality of the Egyptians, identified Thoth with their own god, Hermes, the messenger of the gods and the guider of souls in the realm of the dead. To distinguish the Egyptian Hermes from their own, they gave him the title Trismegistus, meaning thrice great, to honour his sublime wisdom. And the books attributed to him became collectively known as the Hermetica. Although largely unknown today, the writings attributed to Hermes Thoth have been immensely important in the history of Western thought. They profoundly influenced the Greeks and, through their rediscovery in 15th century Florence, helped to inspire the Renaissance, which gave birth to our own modern age. And the list of people who have acknowledged a debt to the Hermetica reads like a who's who of the greatest philosophers, scientists and artists that the West has produced. Leonardo da Vinci, Dura, Botticelli, Roger Bacon, 
Paracelsus, Thomas More, William Blake, Kepler, Copernicus, <coughs> Isaac Newton, Sir Walter Raleigh, Milton, Ben Johnson, Daniel, Foe, Daniel Defoe, Shelley and his wife Mary, Victor Hugo, and Carl Jung. It heavily influenced Shakespeare, John Donne, John Dee and all the poet philosophers who surrounded the court of Queen Elizabeth I, as well as the founding scientists of the Royal Society in London, and even the leaders who inspired the Protestant Reformation in Europe. The list is endless, with the Hermeticus influence reaching well beyond the frontiers of Europe. Islamic mystics and philosophers also trace their inspiration back to thrice great Hermes, and the esoteric tradition of the Jews equated him with their mysterious prophet Enoch. The Hermetica is a cornerstone of Western culture. In substance and importance, it is equal to well-known Eastern scriptures like the Upanishads, the Dharmapada, and the Tao Te Ching. Yet, unlike these texts, which are now readily available and widely read, the works of Hermes have been lost under the dead weight of academic translations, Christian prejudice, and occult obscurities. Until now, no simplified rendering of these writings has been available to the general reader. All previous versions in the English language are very dense, impenetrable, and loaded down with notes and subtexts that make them difficult to digest. This new version, however, makes this ancient wisdom more easily accessible. It presents carefully selected extracts of the Hermetic texts, linked together into a narrative, and rendered into easily understood English. What emerges is an inspiring and illuminating taste of a forgotten classic. Forgive the hyperbole there. We were, we were young at the time, but there you go. The early origins of the Hermetica are shrouded in mystery, but the evidence suggests it is a direct descendant of the ancient philosophy of the Egyptians. However, the handful of surviving works attributed to Hermes are not written in ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs, but in Greek, Latin, and Coptic. They were collated in the city of Alexandria in Egypt during the second and third centuries CE. Here, the Hermetic philosophy helped inspire some of the greatest intellectual achievements of the ancient world. Alexandria was a great center of learning, surpassing even Athens. Its founder, Alexander the Great, had conquered and united Greece, Persia, Egypt, and India into one vast empire. Cultures that had grown up more or less independently were brought together, and there was no bigger melting pot than Alexandria. Into this new cosmopolis, or universal city, poured men and women of every race and nation. Greeks, Jews, Egyptians, Babylonians, Phoenicians, and even Buddhists from India associated here together in relative peace. The Alexandrians were renowned for their thirst for knowledge, and under the enlightened Greek ruler Ptolemy I, a library and museum were founded where human beings first systematically collected the wisdom of the world. At its height, the Library of Alexandria housed some half a million scrolls. These included the works of Euclid, Archimedes, the astronomy Ptolemy, who dominated the spheres of geometry, mathematics, and geography, respectively, well into the Middle Ages. It contained the research of Aristarchus of Samos, who had shown that the Earth is one of the planets orbiting the Sun. Eratosthenes, who had calculated the circumference of the Earth to within a few percent. Scientists of the, library, of the library knew about the precession of the equinoxes and that the moon was responsible for the rhythm of the tides. But Alexandria was also rich in esoteric knowledge. Pythagoreanism, Chaldean oracles, Greek myths, Platonic and Stoic philosophy, Judaism, Christianity, the Greek mystery schools, Zoroastrianism, astrology, alchemy, Buddhism, and of course, the ancient Egyptian religion were all practiced, studied, compared, and discussed. The golden age of Alexandria came to an end with the birth of the intolerant Christian, holy Roman Empire. Despite the sophistication and cultural achievements of the ancients, 
The Christians refer to them dismissively as pagans, which means country dweller. In 415 CE, Hypatia, one of the last great scientists and pagan philosophies work, philosophers working at the Library of Alexandria, was seized by a mob of Christians who removed her flesh with scallop shells and burnt her remains. Their leader, Bishop Cyril, was later canonized Saint Cyril. The great library was finally destroyed as so much pagan superstition and this wealth of knowledge was scattered to the wind. The Christian Roman Emperor Theodosius closed pagan temples across the empire and began the previously unknown phenomenon of book burning. For the West, the fifth century ushered in a thousand year period appropriately known as the Dark Ages. History shows, however, that wherever the works of Hermes have been studied and venerated, civilization has flourished. Pagan scholars and sages flew, fled to the newly emerging Arab culture, taking their knowledge and the Hermetic writings with them. 200 years later, the Muslims created an empire whose learning and scientific achievements were unsurpassed. By the beginning of the 9th century, the first university was established in Baghdad, called the House of Wisdom. Here, many pagan works were translated. The sciences that had reached such heights in Alexandria were significantly developed, and the ancient pagan spiritual wisdom was covertly studied and practiced. From its exalted position among the sacred scriptures of Egyptian spirituality, the Hermetica became the secret inspiration for an important undercurrent in Islamic philosophy and the holy book of unorthodox religious sects such as the Sabians. We would never have heard of the mysterious Sabians had they not come into conflict with the religious authorities of their day. Several centuries after the death of its founder, Muhammad, Islam was beginning to succumb to the same desire for orthodoxy that had, aris that had arisen in the Christian West. Heretics were to be rooted out, if necessary, with violence. In 830 CE, a powerful caliph was passing through the city of Haran when he noticed the strangely dressed Sabians and questioned their leaders. Asked to produce their sacred texts, they returned with the books of Hermes. The genius philosopher scientist Thabit ibn Kura was a Sabian who in 810 CE wrote the following rousing defense of Hermetic paganism. We are the heirs and propagators of paganism, he wrote. Happy is he who, for the sake of paganism, bears the burden of persecution with firm hope. Who else have civilized the world and built cities, if not the nobles and kings of paganism? Who else have set in order the harbors and the rivers? And who else have taught the hidden wisdom? To whom else has the deity revealed itself? given oracles and foretold the future, if not the famous men among the pagans. The pagans have made known all of this. They have discovered the art of healing the body. They have also made known the art of healing the soul. They have filled the earth with settled forms of government and with wisdom, which is the highest good. Without paganism, the world would be empty and miserable. Good old Thabit. What a great speech. I think he was probably decapitated oh, soon after. Another unorthodox orthodox group within the Islamic empire who also traced their ancestry back to thrice great Hermes were the poets and mystics known as the Sufis. The 12th century Iranian Sufi philosopher Yaiz Surawadi made it his life's work to link what he called the original oriental religion with Islam. He claimed that the sages of the ancient world had preached a single doctrine. This had been originally revealed to Hermes, whom Surawadi identified with the prophet known as Idris in the Quran and the Jewish prophet Enoch. In the Greek world, he claimed, this philosophy had been transmitted through Pythagoras and Plato and in the Middle East through the Zoroastrian Magi. It had been secretly passed on until it had reached himself through a direct line of enlightened sages, including his own master, the Sufi mystic 
al-Halaj. Not surprisingly, both Surawadi and al-Halaj were executed by the religious authorities for heresy. Al-Halaj by crucifixion. Hermes and the reawakening of Europe. With the Arab empire becoming increasingly intolerant, the owners of the Hermetic books traveled in search of a safe refuge. In the 15th century, many fled to the tolerant city-state of Florence in northern Italy, where this wisdom again inspired a great cultural flowering. In 1438, the Byzantine scholar Gemisto Plethon made available to the awestruck Florentines the entire lost works of Plato. These and other pagan works were translated into Latin for the first time. The ruler of Florence, the philanthropist and scholar Cosimo de Medici, established a new Platonic Academy, a group of intellectuals and mystics who found their inspiration in the ancient pagan philosophy. It influenced great names like Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, Botticelli, and Raphael, who began painting pictures of the ancient pagan gods. Botticelli's Venus and Mars, for example, was painted at a precise astrological moment as a talisman of occult radiance, capable of magically transporting the viewers to an altered state of spiritual awareness. Cosimo Medici sent out angels to look for other lost pagan works that might still be awaiting discovery. In 1460, one of them came across the lost works of thrice great Hermes and brought them to Florence. The Florentines, already reeling from the discovery that an ancient civilization of immense sophistication had risen and fallen nearly 2,000 years before them, the Greek civilization, now believed they had in their hands one of the most ancient sages of them all. Cosimo ordered his young Greek scholar, Marsilio Ficino, to cease his work on translating Plato and to begin immediately on this new Egyptian text. Ficino had it in ready in time to read to Cosimo just before his death. The emergence of a glorious new culture in Florence signaled the end of the Dark Ages. We call this period the Renaissance, meaning rebirth, which is a fitting name, for at the heart of the Hermetic philosophy is the idea of being spiritually reborn. And the ancient pagan wisdom arrived in Florence at a fortuitous moment in history. Within a few years, the first printing presses arrived in Italy, and the pagan wisdom was printed and dispersed throughout Europe. Students of the new learning, as the Florentine experiment became known, were sent out as emissaries, beginning new movements wherever they went. Rücklin, the father of the Reformation and teacher of Erasmus and Luther, left Florence and sowed the earlier seeds of the Protestant Reformation in Germany. Thomas Linacre founded the Royal College of Physicians in London. The mathematician Nicholas of Cusa, the physician Paracelsus, the architect Brunelleschi, and the astronomer Toscanelli, whose famous map inspired Christopher Columbus, all owed their inspiration to the Florentine reawakening of the spirit of ancient paganism. Copernicus's momentous claim that the sun, not the earth, was at the center of the solar system was a choice, not a discovery. He made it after studying the Hermetic Platonic philosophy at an Italian university. And on the first page of On the Revolution of the Celestial Orbs, published in 1543, Copernicus quotes the words of thrice great Hermes, the sun is the visible God. As in Alexandria a thousand years earlier, the Renaissance viewed science, art, literature and religion as parts of a united whole to be studied together. All aspects of human life were now opened up as legitimate areas of investigation. It was a situation that challenged the authority of the Roman Catholic Church. And in 1492, with the aid of the King of France, they crushed the Republic of Florence. But although the heady days of the new academy were over, the suppression was too late to prevent the ripples of its influence expanding ever outwards. Florentine scholars were dispersed across Europe 
and became known as the fifth essence. The taste for all things Italian, art, sculpture, fashion, literature, and philosophy was insatiable. Within less than 200 years, the Renaissance had conquered Europe. In England, the works of Hermes had a profound effect on the circle of courtiers surrounding Elizabeth I. Sir Philip Sidney, Sir Walter Raleigh, John Donne, Christopher Marlowe, William Shakespeare, George Chapman and Francis Bacon were all acquainted with the works of the Egyptian sage. Elizabeth, Elizabeth's personal astrologer, whom she referred to as her philosopher, was the enigmatic hermeticist John Dee. He was a brilliant mathematician and the first person to translate the complete works of Euclid into English. Dr. Dee owned the greatest library in England and his home was regarded as a third university. He was visited by scholars from all over Europe and made frequent journeys to Prague where the first detailed commentaries on the Hermetica were being written. At this time, Prague was the capital of Bohemia, an enlightened republic where Hermetic scholars, Platonic philosophers, Jewish rabbis, and scientists of every nation found sanctuary at the court of Rudolf II. Europe was being ravaged by the wars of religion between Protestants and Catholics, but in Bohemia, another way was proposed, Hermeticism. Evangelists of the new Egyptian religion, such as Giordano Bruno, travelled extensively in Europe. Bruno interpreted the new sun-centred cosmos proposed by Copernicus in an entirely mystical way as the rising of a new dawn of a new age. He believed that the Egyptian religion of Hermes was the ancestor of the Greek mystery schools, the religion of Moses and the Jews, and the birthplace of Christianity. In Bruno's imagination, it was now poised to become the unifying religion in which Jews, all denominations of Christians, Platonic humanists, and even Muslims could meet and resolve their differences. Bruno's courage and conviction was nowhere more clearly demonstrated than in his decision to return to Italy, where, within a short time, he was arrested by the Roman Catholic Church. He endured eight years of torture, during which he refused to recant, and in 1600 was led out into the Square of Flowers in Rome and ceremonially burnt alive. And in fact, we dedicate the book to the memory of Giordano Bruno, who is a, a great hero. The vision of a universal hermetic religion was fated to fade, but its influence remained strong amongst visionaries and scientists. Sir Isaac Newton, for example, like many men of his time, was passionately interested in alchemy, the patron god of which was thrice great Hermes. Indeed, the word alchemy means from Egypt. The astronomer Kepler published quotes from the Hermetica in his greatest work on the harmony of the world. And in 1640, the poet John Milton celebrated the, the wisdom of Hermes, writing, this is from Il Penseroso, his poem. Or let my lamp at midnight hour be seen in some high lonely tower where I may oft outwatch out the bear with thrice great Hermes or unsphere the spirit of Plato to unfold what worlds or what vast regions hold the immortal mind that hath forsook her mansion in this fleshly nook. At the same time as Milton was writing, however, the ground was being cut away from under the authenticity of the Hermetica. Previously, these works had been believed to be of extreme antiquity, dating back to the time of the pharaohs. But in 1640, a scholar called Isaac Casibon published a textual analysis of the Hermetica, which showed, quite correctly, that the grammar, vocabulary, form and content of the Greek versions of these works dated them to no earlier than the second and third centuries CE. They were not written by an ancient Egyptian sage, he claimed, but by scholars working in the city of Alexandria. Their philosophy was nothing more than an exotic blend of Greek, Christian and Jewish philosophy mixed up with astrology and magic. The Egyptian names that pepper the text were mere decoration. K 
Casbon was one of the most brilliant Greek scholars of his time, and with the encouragement of the Christian status quo, his damning criticism was generally accepted. Casbon had dealt the Egyptian sage a fatal blow, and the books of Hermes were destined to be forgotten as fakes and forgery. In the modern world, we know from the actions of the tabloid press just how one well-timed hatchet job can unjustifiably undermine someone's reputation for good. And this is exactly what happened to thrice great Hermes. Casabon was a fine scholar, but he was motivated by a hidden political agenda. The ultra-Orthodox James I was now on the throne of England, and he employed Casabon and others to purge the magically inclined court of Elizabeth. Hermeticists like John Dee were ostracized, and later Casabon's son Merrick wrote a book which portrayed the great philosopher as a confused occultist. D died alone and forgotten. Nonetheless, some of Casabon's claims regarding the Hermetica are true. The books of Hermes are undoubtedly the product of many authors and not one ancient sage, and they were certainly composed in the first few centuries of our era. Hermes was, Hermes was credited with these writings, even though we know they were comp the composite works of many scholars, but this does not discredit them or Hermes. It was a common practice in antiquity for authors to ascribe their work to the God who gave them inspiration. This was a mark of respect, not an attempt to deceive. On the second charge, Casabon is also right to claim that the Hermetica was written down in second century Alexandria. But all the modern evidence suggests that it does express Egyptian beliefs filtered through the understanding of the Greek scholars of the period. And even if all Casabon's criticisms were correct, this would neither diminish the Hermetica's wisdom nor alter the fact that it has profoundly influenced some of the greatest minds in history. It is as old as the Christian Gospels. It's older than the Quran. It is one of the great sacred texts of the world, and it's worthy of respect and study for these reasons alone. But when Casabon was writing, very little was actually known about ancient Egypt. The hieroglyphs themselves were not translated until two centuries after his death. Consequently, many modern scholars now believe that he was wrong to see the Hermetic philosophy as a second century innovation, especially since the discovery of the pyramid texts of Saqqara at the end of the last century. These hieroglyphs are over 5,000 5, years old and yet contain doctrines that are identical to those expounded in the Hermetica. This suggests that the Hermetica may indeed contain the wisdom of the pharaohs, which scholars in second century Alexandria reworked for a contemporary readership. The Hermetica contains passages reminiscent of Jewish, Christian and Greek works, which Casabon saw as proof that the Hermetica is a forgery created from a hodgepodge of these other philosophies. Alexandria was such an eclectic environment this is plausible. The ancients themselves, however, believed that these traditions were influenced by the Egyptian philosophy contained within the Hermetica. The Jews are said to have lived for many years in exile in Egypt, and their greatest prophet Moses was brought up as an Egyptian. Many early Christians lived in Egypt, and the Greeks were in awe of the Egyptians, compared to whom they felt like children. The ancient Greek historian Herodotus writes, the Egyptians are religious to excess, beyond any other nation in the world. They are meticulous in anything which concerns their religion. It was only, if I may put it so, the day before yesterday that the Greeks came to know the origin and forms of the various gods. The names of all the gods came to Greece from Egypt, for the names of all the gods have been known in Egypt from the beginning of time. Casabon particularly claims that the Hermetic philosophy plagiarized the Timaeus, a work written by the Greek philosopher Plato in the 5th century BCE. Like the Hermetica, it too includes the doctrines of astrology and reincarnation. Yet these ideas played no part in early Greek religion. So where did they come from? The answer is ancient Egypt. Over a hundred years before Plato, the Greek sage Pythagoras had set out on a journey to acquire the knowledge of the world. This led him to Egypt, where he spent 22 years in the temples, 
being initiated into the religion of the Egyptians. According to the ancient Greek scholar Diogenes Laertius, Plato purchased three books of Pythagorean doctrines based on Egyptian wisdom, and these he adapted into the Timaeus. So the similarities between the works of Plato and the Hermetica are not surprising, since many of Plato's ideas were direct descendants of ancient Egyptian philosophy. Hermetic philosophy also influenced Christianity through the Alexandrian church fathers, St. Clement, Clement and St. Oregon, who synthesized pagan and Christian religious doctrines. It is due to such theologians that the Hermetic concept of the word is found in the opening verse of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the word. Hermes Thoth was known to the ancients as the scribe of the gods and master of the word. In the Hermetica, God utters a word which calms the chaotic waters of creation. The word is even called the Son of God. In Christianity, Jesus Christ, who is also called the Son of God, is identified as an embodiment of the power of the word. Saint Augustine, the influential 4th century theologian who was familiar with the works of Hermes, writes, that which is called the Christian religion existed amongst the ancients and never did not exist. From the beginning of the human race until Christ came in the flesh, at which time the true religion, which already existed, began to be called Christianity. The influence of the Hermetica on early Christianity is beyond doubt. In 1945, works of Hermes were discovered amongst scriptures belonging to Gnostic Christians of the first centuries. And according to a note on one of the texts, early Christian communities possessed many copies of the works of Hermes. Just a few yards from the place where these scriptures were found are ancient Egyptian tombs. And these were inhabited by early Christian hermits, such as Saint Pacomius, the founder of the first Christian monastic community. The walls of these tombs are covered in hieroglyphs ascribed to the great god Thoth. They describe a spiritual rebirth into knowledge of God. And in such places, early Christians poured over the Hermetica. Under its powerful influence, they composed their own philosophy of a saving gnosis, a direct knowledge of God, but this time bestowed by their Messiah, Jesus. All the evidence suggests that Casabon was wrong to simply dismiss the Hermetica as some cobbled together mixture of different philosophies the Hermetica was undoubtedly written by Alexandrian scholars for a Greek-speaking readership, but it contains a powerful echo of the ancient wisdom on which it was based. It offers us one of the best windows available to gaze into Egypt's remotest past. With its help, we can understand the mystical vision that inspired the awesome pyramids. But what is the Hermetic philosophy that has held such a profound fascination for some of the greatest minds in history. At the heart of Hermes' teaching is one simple idea. God is a big mind. Everything which exists is a thought in the mind of God. This book is a thought in the mind of God. Your body is a thought in the mind of God. These ideas are thoughts in the mind of God. But how can we understand this? Consider for a moment your own experience. Thoughts and feelings exist within your mind. You know the outer world around you because your senses give you information which you also experience within your mind. When your mind is completely unconscious, you don't experience anything. Ultimately, everything that exists in your life is a thought within your mind. Your mind, however, is limited by being trapped in a physical body. But imagine for a moment that it is not. Imagine that it is free to be conscious of everything, at all times and in all places. Then everything that is, has been and will be would, exhort, would exist as a thought within your mind. And this is the nature of God's mind. He is not limited by a physical body. He is the big mind within which everything exists. Hermes describes the mind of God as the oneness which unites everything. What does this mean? Again, look at your own experience. You experience many different things with your mind. Right now, you're listening to me reading this book. 
Before that, you may have been eating or walking in the country. Yet all of these different things are experienced by one thing, your mind. It is the oneness that unites all of your experience. In the same way, God's mind is the oneness which unites everything. Hermes says that this oneness contains all opposites. And this paradox can be understood by once more looking at the nature of your own mind. Some things you experience are hot and others cold. Some are bright and others dark. Some you call good and others bad. Nothing that you experience can be both hot and cold because they are opposites. Yet both cold and hot are experiences which you have. Your mind is the one thing which contains all opposites. And Hermes teaches that the mind of a human being is made in the image of God's big mind. If we can free our mind from the limitations imposed by the physical body, we can experience the mind of God. And we were created with the specific purpose of learning to do this. This is the spiritual goal of human life. To reach this destination, we must expand our awareness. We must use the power of our little minds to reach out to God's big mind. And to help us do this, Hermes narrates a dramatic story of how God creates and maintains the cosmos. It is through appreciating the awesome beauty of the cosmos and understanding the fundamental laws by which it functions that we can come to know the mind of God. And it was this vision which fired the imaginations of the great minds of history. It inspired the birth of science by encouraging them to explore the mind of God by seeking to discover more of how the universe works. Some great modern scientists, such as Albert Einstein and Stephen Hawking, still describe science as an attempt to understand the mind of God. The Hermetic philosophy places man at the very center of God's creation. Hermes declares that man is a marvel. With his mind, he may not only understand the universe, but even come to know God. He is not a mortal body which will live and die. He is an immortal soul which, through the experience of spiritual rebirth, may become a god. A book of this size, however, cannot contain all the hermetic teachings. It can, however, give an inspirational and intriguing taste of their core doc doctrines. The main surviving philosophical hermetic texts are 18 books known as the Cor Corpus Hermeticum, of which 17 survive. Book, book 25 is still missing. The Hesclepius, the Stobius, and various fragments. These works are dense and somewhat impenetrable, but in this new version, we have selected key texts and combined them to bring out the essential wisdom and inherent poetry that they contain. In this endeavor, we feel we are following in the footsteps of the scholars of Alexandria who collated these books from the ancient material that was available. Our sources are contained in notes at the back of the book, but for most readers, it will be enough to follow a progressive exposition of the essence of Hermeticism condensed into more manageable sections. Like many Greek texts, the Hermetic teachings are often presented in the form of dialogues between teacher and pupil. The voices change in the different texts, which can be confusing. So we have chosen to avoid this device and simply present a monologue by Hermes addressed to the reader. Although we have used the familiar term God in the explanatory notes, which accompany each chapter, we avo avoided this name in the text itself. Instead, we have used the word Artem, one of the ancient Egyptian names for the supreme one God. We felt that using this unfamiliar Egyptian name would allow the reader to, the opportunity to build up their own conceptual picture of what Hermes means by the term, free of any associations they may have with the word of God. It's a daunting task to present a new version of any work that is written in a foreign language and uses a distinct and unique conceptual vocabulary. Approaching a text which is also of extreme antiquity and has already been through the hands of numbers of translators, is doubly difficult. As Hermes himself writes, my teachings will seem more obscure in times to come, when they are translated from our Egyptian mother tongue into that of the Greeks. Translation will distort much of their meaning. Expressed in our native language, the teachings are clear and simple, 
for the very sound of an Egyptian word resonates with the thing signified by it. All possible measures should be taken to prevent these holy secrets being corrupted by translation into Greek, which is an arrogant, feeble, showy language, <laughs> unable to contain the cogent force of my words. The Greek language lacks the power to convince, and Greek philosophy is nothing but noisy chatter. Our Egyptian speech is much more than talk. Its utterances are replete with power. In the ancient Egyptian language, the sound of a word had a magical power which complemented its meaning. A view of language which we unconsciously retain when we talk of spelling a word. Translation inevitably means that we have lost this original power and clarity. Hermes teaches, however, that through the power of the mind, all things are possible. We have tried, through the power of contemplation which Hermes advocates, to distill the essence of his teachings for a new generation of spiritual seekers. And although human culture has changed beyond recognition from the times of the ancient Egyptians, the essential mysteries of life have remained what they have always been and always will be. For those alive to these mysteries, the writings of Hermes are as relevant today as they were in the past. We hope this new version captures as much as possible of the Hermetic vision, playing some small part in restoring to this ancient wisdom the respect that it is due. Thank you. So yeah, although that was written in 1997, I still hold with that. I still think that it's a fascinating insight into the ancient Egyptian culture and the Greek culture and the Renaissance and all of our culture, really. And it's a particular hobby horse of mine, which I might get on now and ride off into the sunset, which is that memory, the correct memory of who we are where we've come from is essential to understanding who we are right now and where we're going. And we live in a culture which has been so balderized by the Christian takeover, which has endured for a couple of thousand years, and has given us a completely mistaken identity of who we are. Our memory is wrong and there's a phrase which struck me many years ago when I first heard it and I I still think it's true a nation without a history is like a man without a memory and if any of you have had the misfortune to know somebody who's had Alzheimer's or lost their memory their identity dissolves you all woke up this morning you knew who you were what you were doing, where you'd come from. You know what you'll be doing later on. Your identity is your personality. Your memory of, uh, is your identity. And without a correct memory, we don't know who we are and where we're going. So for me, history is a sacred science. Because now with modern technology, we are beginning to understand more and more about who we are, where we've come from. And also, it's about giving credit where credit is due. You know, studying classics, I began to realise that in the 19th century, when classics was invented as the syllabus for boarding schools to train up young people who would go out and run the British Empire. And of course, you couldn't suggest to these people that the Egyptians or the Indians, or the Persians, had contributed anything to Western culture. These were the people that you were being trained up to go and dominate. So essentially, classics imbued a racist philosophy. And according to some classicists, it still does. There is still this attitude that the East has nothing to teach us. And I would like to be a part of trashing this pernicious doctrine because I think it's all our past. We're once again living in a cosmopolitan society, globalisation. The wisdom of the world is available to us 
and this narrow view of the West as having created itself out of nothing began with the Greeks, who owed nothing to their forebears, is wrong. And I hope that our work has done something towards bringing our memories back as they should be. Thank you very much.